everyone. Welcome to Let's Talk World Talk Show presented by Clickaway Creator. Today we have Mr. Aves Babur with us. Mr. Babur is a graduate from one of the top universities of the world, which is Cardiff University in the UK. And he's also a distinguished advocate, primarily practicing in the Honorable High Courts of Islamabad and Peshawar, Pakistan. After his graduation, uh, Aves also uh, became a barrister from the Honorable Society of Lincoln in London, UK. Soon after completing his legal studies, he founded his uh, own chambers, which is called AB Law Chambers, and continued to display his skills in various legal cases, including uh, as a defense counsel in National Accountability Bureau. Uh, he has also uh, represented and he still is uh, representing prominent departments and entities such as uh, Federal Board of Revenue, uh, Pakistan Tourism and uh, Development Corporation, uh, not to forget Oil and Gas Development Corporation. In addition to uh, marking his excellence in, uh, in criminal and constitutional law. Due to his expertise in constitutional matters, he was recently appointed as an amicus curiae uh, by the Honorable High Court Peshawar to assist the Honorable Court in the matter requiring constitutional expertise, which is a huge honor for any young advocate. And uh, we are glad that uh, Mr. Babur got that opportunity and due to his persistent and impressive insight into law, he later also got associated with the top legal firm of Pakistan, Hyatt and Mirji. I can go on and on, absolutely. I mean, I have everything in front of me uh, right now when it comes to his uh, bio. Um, but uh, I think without any further ado, let me just introduce you to the man himself uh, who has achieved so much already in the span of just six to seven years. So, hi. Hi, Aves. How are you? Uh, I'm so sorry if it was a lengthy uh, or, or a really long uh, intro, but uh, you absolutely deserve it, and we're really excited to know a lot about you. Such a fantastic uh, introduction. I have started loving myself even more now. Um, <laughs> thank you so much. Actually, I have been uh, very passionate uh, of becoming a uh, barrister ever since I was a child. I mean... Uh, there were other kids who would like things like they would see a plane and they would say, I want to become a pilot. There were some who would say they would want to become doctors, engineers, and all those things never excited me. Um, and one day I was watching a film. It might sound a bit funny, but that's how I started to decide that this is what I want to become. Uh, so I, watching, I was watching a film. There were court proceedings and both the advocates were fighting for their clients. And finally, the judge I'm sorry decided. Sorry to interrupt you, Mayor. Please also know the name of the movie. <laughs> you, if you would really want to know, it's a, a Bollywood film called Mary Junk. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yes. So there's Anil Kapoor and uh, uh, Amresh Puri uh, in yeah. in that film. And although it might sound a bit funny, but uh, if a guy can, uh, if a if a child can decide to become a pilot by watching. A, an aeroplane in the sky, so it was the same for me. Well, yeah. uh, I, I wouldn't have been able to go to court anyway, so I saw what a court is in a film as a child. So so that <laughs> was like uh, when I saw Anil Kapoor uh, arguing his case, uh, and I was like, this is what I want to become. This is what I want to be. So while I was watching him uh, argue his case, fighting for his client, taking somebody else's shoulders on his shoulders and absorbing that pressure, so I was like, this is what I want to be. So I said to my parents uh, that, uh, so people would ask me like, what, what would you be when you grow up? And I was like, I'm going to be a barrister because I had heard that uh, the founder of Pakistan as well as India, uh, uh, Mr. Gandhi, both were barristers. So I was like, uh, so these people even go as far as making a country. So this is what I want to be. So that's how it all started. Uh, there were some issues I had to convince my family over and over again that I do not want to become an engineer or a doctor. And later on, uh, we saw a glimpse of the awareness in the form of the Indian film called Three Idiots. So I was glad later on that I made the right decision. <laughs> that is really inspiring. And as you said, uh, there is no limit to what you can dream of. Course. Sure, sure, sure. I mean, 
by looking at a plane which actually looks like an ant, uh, an ant in the sky. I mean, as a person can think of becoming an air hostess or a pilot, then of course, by watching a movie, you can get inspired. I'm, exactly. I'm actually watching Suits these days, so I am really inspired to become a lawyer. Some that is great. The Suits is a great <laughs> series. There is another one I would recommend. It's The Good Wife. Good Wife. Okay. The Good Wife. Yeah. Wow. And it's also a legal series. Yeah. I will watch it for sure. Thank you. Thank you so much for that recommendation. Also, thank you for throwing uh, light on on your journey uh, so far as a legal professional. Uh, Avis, I am going to ask you a very unfair question because I get this a lot. Uh, but if you can just throw light on one of the legal issues that you have worked on. I'm sure that you face this on daily basis. Every issue and every transaction or case is as important as the other for you. But if you can just describe the complexity of that particular matter and how did you approach it, that would give our viewers an idea of combating their struggles and the situations that they are in right now. Sure, actually, um, um, I have had to choose from a big chunk of cases of to which one I should uh, discuss uh, with Lex Proc. So I'm going to discuss the most distinguished one. Um, I had uh, represented a client of mine who resided in Saudi Arabia, uh, while a re international red warrant was, was issued against him by the Interpol. Okay. So um, there were two tasks. One was how would I represent him while he is in Saudi Arabia? Um, while I would be making a petition in the Honorable High Court of Pakistan. So how would, uh, who would make that petition? That was the biggest task. So, and another task was to convince the Honorable Court to suspend his international red warrant had, as it had been wrongly issued. So what I did was, um, uh, my client, uh, uh, through his family members in Pakistan, contacted me. So I told them that uh, someone within their family would have to make a petition on his behalf in Pakistan so that uh, the Honorable High Court issue an order uh, to the Ministry of Interior to withdraw their request to the Interpol for issuing the red warrant against this person. But this, these people had been to every uh, big criminal lawyer in our city and almost all of them told him that uh, the cancellation or suspension of international red warrant is almost impossible. Um, when the case came to me, uh, it, it is somewhere around three, four, three years ago, I was pretty much in the beginning of things. Uh, my career had just started to pick up. So it was a big risk as well, losing this case. But I uh, started studying it. And I thankfully, with the help of one of my mentors, his name is Mr. Aurangzeb, uh, I, I, I cracked the code and I uh, filed the petition on behalf of his wife. I convinced the Honorable Court that she has a legal standing to file a petition on behalf of her husband. And uh, then the court asked me, um, how is she affected? Uh, because the red warrant has been issued against her husband. So how come she could make a petition on his behalf? So I uh, convinced the Honorable Court with the different case laws that a wife could file a petition on behalf of her husband when he is not able to. And this was the case here. And after our rigorous arguments, uh, thankfully, and it was uh, during the peak of COVID, um, when there, there were big lockdowns and only very few cases used to be fixed in the Honorable High Court. So my case was fixed on number one uh, on urgent basis. I argued my case, I convinced the Honorable Court and the Honorable Court on our petition suspended the international red warrant against, uh, issued against my client in Saudi Arabia. So that was a big achievement uh, in regard that it, it had never been done before in Pakistan. And I had uh, cracked the code uh, with the help of my mentor and uh, gone into those case laws, which would help convince the honorable bench. Thank you so much, Avis, for sharing that. Uh, also, uh, when you were doing all of this, when the process was going on, uh, just for the comparison, do you think that the pandemic kind of made it tougher for you or uh, it, it was all right? I mean, it was manageable. Or you or you think if, if we were pre-pandemic, then things would have been easier for you to handle? Um, a pandemic wasn't an issue in that. I mean, it was an issue in some regards. But uh, you, you see, uh, in our subcontinent, uh, pandem pandemic wasn't taken that seriously as opposed to European countries. I mean, we were violating the 
courts every now and then nobody would wear masks and uh, then people came up with conspiracy theories that since we are a nation who go through difficulties our immunities are strong so th there were a lot of uh, <laughs> fantasies in our mind so uh, the only thing i was afraid of uh, was the, about my father because he already had a lung disease so i used to be afraid about him a lot uh, i wasn't uh, that much afraid about myself i i did take certain measures like wearing a mask and not trying to shake hands with everyone but uh, in fact pandemic pandemic uh, helped uh, me uh, argue this case in some ways because only very uh, uh, few cases were being fixed in those days and i felt pride that i've got such an urgent matter which is being argued in a court case even though it's a pandemic uh, so it kind of uh, helped me in another way but uh, there were difficulties but as i said that we live in a country that the things were generally not taken that seriously and thankfully um, i'm fine now and my so is my family unfortunately my father passed away last year uh, due to covid and that is the big missed uh, thing but it hasn't affected my career much i'm really sorry to hear that avish uh, thank you both. but uh, thank you very much for being so patient with this question um coming back to pandemic uh, as we are on the topic uh, you have seen that we have uh, you know we have kind of gone virtual now obviously things are opening up but i see in india there are still virtual hearings going on somewhere sometimes right so you have seen that pandemic uh, big, and it thanks to pandemic because we kind of got into remote proceedings and availability according to you uh, do you think this is um, sustainable and like a possible way to increase the access to justice you see i am of the belief that uh, uh, we are not taking advantage of the modern technology as much as we should um, just like see we are, are talking to each other because of this modern technology um, it may not have been possible 20 to 30 years ago uh, if lex talk and i were uh, talking to each other in uh, 1978 perhaps it would have been very inconvenient it may never have happened actually so a lot of things that are happening now in in today's world are due to the fact that the technology is there to enable you to do things. So I would say that um, and the uh, use of modern technology in the era of, uh, uh, especially after having be, gone through the pandemic and while it is still alive somehow, that we are not making as much use as uh, is possible. I mean, I sometimes I go to court and I think like, uh, rather than waiting 50 years to do it, why don't we put three, four good monitors in courts, uh, some good audio systems, some good video systems, so that people could get access to justice, even in the era of pandemic and uh, through the modern technology, through mics, through uh, audios. And while we are arguing our cases and the clients, uh, we always submit an affidavit with the court that whatever we are saying before the court is true and correct to the best of our knowledge. So the other issues uh, due to which we are not letting the technology take over uh, uh, can be overcome in other ways. Um, there can, could be e-affidavit systems. Uh, we could do it uh, through an, a, a QR code or something else. So a lot can be done, um, but uh, it's not, uh, we are not going to our full potential, uh, especially the countries of subcontinent. And uh, um, I mean, the developed countries are different. We can't compare ourselves to them. Um, yet at the same time, um, I also believe that uh, uh, we, uh, uh, let me just uh, conclude answer to this question with what Bill Gates said. So Bill Gates said that uh, the pandemic, as he had already predicted that the pandemic would come. So he said the pandemic also came in the 19th uh, century, in the 20th century. But what's different in today's world is that we have technology. We can prepare better against the technology. So we can prepare a better access to justice system especially after having gone through this pandemic. So this is uh, my suggestion to the stakeholders that they may make the best use of technology to overcome this inaccess to justice. Well said, and I don't think that you could have concluded the answer any, any better, Avesh. So thank you so much for beautifully explaining your, uh, you know, your uh, point of view. Uh, in Thank the you. entire situation. Um, Thank you. 
going back to the education background, uh, as you have done your LLB from Cardiff, uh, and uh, then later you have also qualified as a barrister from the Honorable Society of Lincoln Zen. How has your uh, legal education from Britain uh, invigorated your law practice, if at all, if at all? Yeah. Um... I'm often asked this question by uh, young advocates that is there any benefit of becoming a barrister? Is there any benefit of going abroad? And, and what they're actually asking is if you get more money, to be honest, this is actually what they're asking. If, <laughs> if you Trust are me, I'm making- I'm not asking that. I am not. <laughs> no, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the young advocates, not about, oh, right. I, I'm coming to what you had asked. Okay. Um, <laughs> So this is where uh, my education is different. I did not go abroad for my studies to, uh, with the mindset that I will be able to earn more than other lawyers or I would be able to be uh, distinguish myself from other lawyers. For me, it was always about honor. It was always about uh, honor to be a barrister, not that I would be distinguished from other advocates. Secondly, since as I told you that I had become, become passionate about studying law, uh, right in my childhood, unlike many advocates. Um, so I always dreamed for the best education. I promised myself that I would, uh, initially I didn't plan to do my LLB from abroad, but uh, my younger brother had already gone for his ACCA to London. So I suddenly my, got an idea, why not go for LLB as well? If I'm going to do this for the rest of my life, why not study in the best place possible? So uh, it, has it invigorated my practice? Yes, it has fantastically invigorated my practice because most of the things which I otherwise would have done after ten, one or two decades, I started doing in the first five years of my practice. And uh, I'll just share a thought, uh, uh, senior a colleague of mine had uh, told me while I was in Cardiff, I was in first year, he was in third year, he was also from Pakistan. So I suddenly said to him one day, I was like, uh, his name was Sajawal. I was like, Sajawal, I'm studying the law here, I'm very happy and I'm learning a lot. But am I not studying the law of Britain? Uh, would it not be difficult for me to go back to Pakistan and then practice there? So he said a very beautiful phrase in the answer and that suddenly changed my outlook uh, while I was in Britain. He said, Avas, you have not come to Britain to uh, study the law of Britain. You have come to Britain to study how to study law. So that was which uh, suddenly transformed uh, my psyche about why I was there and, uh, uh, and it transformed from just being an honor to uh, something beyond that I have come here to study, to know how to study the law. And once I learn that, I can practice in any country of the world. So that confidence which I got from there, along with the, the other struggle one uh, bears while living abroad, that collectively helped me become a strong-minded advocate. And Alhamdulillah, I'm very happy uh, with what I've done in the last six, seven years. Congratulations to you, Aves, for having Thank you so such much, a good, uh, you know, uh, and, and successful journey so far. And uh, and I just hope that it continues to flourish uh, uh, more than it has been. So far. Inshallah. Uh, now, uh, I, I know, like, we're kind of coming to an end of this amazing conversation that we have been having. Uh, but before I let you, as you have talked a lot about technology, a lot about pandemic, a uh, lot about, uh, you know, uh, about the cases that you have worked on. But just, just, just one thing, which is, uh, which I kind of uh, wanted to ask you that, what made you go, um, you know, in the early years of practice? Uh, in an exigent and challenging profession like law. And actually, I don't want to call law as a profession because now I have been talking to so many lawyers and uh, I just feel that everybody, everybody is so passionate about what they do. And it's, it's one of the Nobel professions that we have in the world. 
Definitely. And it's one of the oldest professions that we have in the world. Not not it is. Forget, not, not to forget that. So it's it's very it it's it's something which uh, I think that I would want to know. And if if I put it out there, then people would also want to know that what made you just choose. I know watching a movie and everything can be one of the inspiration uh, inspirations that that happened to you or occurred to you, but. What in general, like when people were doing so many other things, why did you choose law, especially? Um, you, you see, um, the, there's not an easy uh, answer to that. When you have done your A levels or uh, uh, higher secondary education, right. uh, everybody is kind of telling you that what to do. Uh, people would be telling you go become a doctor, go become an engineer, keeping in view what is available in the market. And uh, I had always been, thankfully, I've always had very good teachers. Um, they've always, they had always taught me to go after what uh, I enjoyed doing rather than to go after what would benefit me in material ways. So um, when I started practicing and when any advocate starts going to, to court, the most difficult thing is when you come back home, your parents, your society, your relatives start asking you, how much are you earning? And that is the worst part in the first few years of practice. Uh, and because normally uh, you don't get paid much by your, um, uh, the big legal firms. Um, you only uh, uh, get a little bit of stipend, which is almost negligible. Um, so some of very good talented people quit and they go into other secondary fields of law. Um, for example, some of, uh, as much as respect as I have for in-house counsels, but some of them become in-house counsels of organizations only because they couldn't bear the pressure, uh, the questions of society and parents because our counterparts in other professions, they at least get paid something, even if it's an internship. Um, but we have to go to a place called court where people come up with their problems, they want an advocate, they're sure about what solves that problem. And for you to be able to uh, show that you can solve problems, you would have to show a very strong metal, uh, uh, very strong forbearance. And um, I have had a tendency of doing hard things in my life. For example, as opposed to doing the most easiest question in exams first, I would rather do the hardest one first uh, so I have, uh, I tend to be a bit unorthodox. So in this uh, scheme of things, uh, and same in law as well. So when those hardships started coming, I was I said to myself, let it be. Uh, it's okay. It will pass. And uh, it's a, uh, a chosen hardship. It's not that somebody has inflicted it upon me. And uh, thankfully, um, uh, due to the fact that I have not been very um, uh, angry about it that I'm going through this hardship. So God, God and very nice people in my life started easing my life up. I got to meet very good people to work with. And I also had a desire that I never wanted to work in a big chamber. Uh, I, I didn't want my CV to be like I have worked with so and so big liar, a lawyer. And uh, I had, uh, said to myself that I would rather become something, a good version of myself rather than copying somebody else. That's beautiful, Avi. That is absolutely beautiful. And uh, I don't know, uh, but I, I just feel that uh, you have kind of inspired uh, and you will be inspiring a lot of people with this interview. Any advice before we come to an end of this beautiful conversation uh, and, and interview? A more of a conversation than the interview. Is there anything that you would like to uh, say to the budding lawyers or just as an advice if you would like to say? You see, um, I would, uh, uh, there are different sorts of lawyers and some have the benefit of being second or third generation lawyers, their parents or uncle, aunts, grandparents have remained lawyers. There are some who like me who have to start it from zero uh, because they don't have any background in their family. I would say both have pros and cons. So these are not the determining factors for your future. I would say if somebody is passionate about becoming an advocate, 
um, stick to it. Don't just quit because you are having a tough time. It is but natural. It is something like mountaineering. So a person who is a mountaineer, he is obviously going through a hardship. He needs a lot of stamina, um, but he's loving it. So you got to love the law profession to be able to survive in it, or else you will become a thief kind of an advocate. <laughs> yeah. That's that's something uh, which I guess goes. Um, I mean, it, it's applicable to uh, everybody in a way. Not giving up and uh, you know. Uh, giving it their best, so uh, it's kind of inspiring to to me as well, and I hope to a lot of other people. Thank you so much, Aves, for an amazing interview. Uh, it has always been a pleasure talking to you, but uh, in in front of uh, people, uh, I'm I'm sure that we were able to uh, kind of put out the best of uh, knowledge and wisdom you possess, and uh, I guess. That's your way of giving back to the community. So I'm really happy that uh, you chose Legstock as a platform to do that. Thank You're you. very welcome, Bharti. <laughs> and uh, thank you so much for your time. And uh, once again, I would wish you a very happy birthday. It was yesterday, I guess. So <laughs> thank you for your time. Thank you to Legstock. And uh, thank you for the opportunity that I had to share my journey with the future advocates of the world. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Avis. And for our viewers, if you like this chat with Avis, uh, please like and share this video and do not forget to subscribe to Click Away Creators YouTube channel to appreciate what we do. And you have more coming from industry legal leaders like Mr. Babur himself. This is Bharti for Talk signing off. Take care.